Hello, welcome to MAT1 Introduction, uh, the first of two lectures covering the Mathematics Admission Test to Oxford University. Okay, the MAT is set by all applicants to the Mathematics or Computer Science courses at Oxford University. The exam is sat in November and syllabus is based on that of AS Mathematics and a few topics from the first term of A2 Mathematics. The MAT is also used by Imperial College London and the University of Warwick. The MAT is also taken into consideration by other universities in the UK, including Bath and Durham for particular courses. The MAT is a two and a half hour non-calculated paper made up of two parts. Section A, 10 multiple choice questions, making up 40% of the total. And section B, five longer questions, making up 60% of the total. And what we're going to do in this lecture is first of all introduce a couple of multiple choice questions to warm you up and then we're going to try a few longer questions. Okay so this is one of the multiple choice questions from 2011. Um, it's, you have to know a little bit about the equation of a circle uh, and some triggers clearly required. So if you'd like to pause now um, and have a go at yourself and then we'll come back to a um, my version of events uh, shortly after that. Okay, so what I've done is I've expanded the equation of the circle um, or rather um, I've factorised it by completing the square into the classic form x minus a squared plus y minus b squared equals r squared. Okay, at first with the maths question again if you're not sure what to do do something you can do, and this is one of the things you can do. If you're, if you're given, for instance, x squared plus y squared plus 4x plus 8y plus 10 equals naught, and you want to investigate that circle, probably the best thing to do is to complete the square to write it in this classic form. So, I've completed the square, okay, in red above, and now I'm just going to tidy it up a little bit. Okay, so that's what I'll do next. Okay, so if you look at the bottom of the screen, um, I've taken everything over to the, or everything apart from the squared brackets over to the um, right hand side to get it in that standard form and so the right hand side now is equivalent to the radius squared. Now I can take four of those cos squared and four of those sine squared together to equal four um, because sine squared plus cos squared is one of course um, and it tidies up in the end to minus six plus twelve sine squared theta. That's, that's meant to be the radius squared. Now of course the radius squared has to be a positive number. So I've set 12s sine squared theta minus 6 to be greater than or equal to naught. Tidy that up a little, and we get two possible areas of sets of values for which sine theta, uh, for which 12 sine squared, theta, sine squared theta minus 6 is greater than or equal to naught. Sine theta is greater than or equal to 1 over root 2, or less than or equal to mo minus 1 over root 2. Now, let's draw, a, draw the sine curve and we can investigate this further. Okay, if you look at the bottom of the screen, um, I've drawn the sine square between naught and pi because that's what the question asks. Um, straight away we notice that sine theta is always positive, so I can get rid of the sine theta is less than or equal to minus 1 over root 2, so I've crossed it out there, and concentrate only on the positive 1 over root 2. Now, these trig ratios, exact trig ratios, um, are something you should learn, not so much for a, S and A2, although they are useful, but you have your calculators there, but here you need to know that, for instance, cos of 60 is a half, or tan of 60 is um, root 3. In this case, we're talking about radians, you should know that um, sine theta is 1 over root 2 at 45 degrees, and then by symmetry 135 degrees, which is pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4. Even if you didn't know that, if you sketch this, you'd spot that the answers have to be trapped in a region between two values, okay? neither of which is naught, so it's clearly going to be b. Now I've got a subtle beef with the um, actual Oxford um, approach to this because they've gone for a, a strict inequality, a less than theta and less than after the theta, whereas I think it should be a less than or equals because what they've said is the radius can't be zero, okay? Um, but a circle, if you shrink the radius to zero, it becomes a point, um, and that's still technically a circle, 
albeit what's known as a degenerate circle. Um, so I think it should in fact be an equal sign in that inequality. It shouldn't be a strict inequality. Okay. So we're looking at a multiple choice question from 2014. It's asking which of these five graphs is a graph of the function y equals log to the base 10 of x squared minus 2x plus 2. Now we'll, we'll need to have a think about what the log to the base 10x graph looks like itself and also a little investigation of what x squared minus 2x plus 2 is. Okay. Now for the quadratic, if you look in the top corner, I've completed the square because they love completing the square for mat and step. So we'll write it in that form. It's a very useful form anyway of the quadratic. And in the bottom right, we've drawn the graph of y equals log to the base 10 of x. It's the same as the natural log graph or log to the base 2 of x graph. They all have a very similar shape. Now, what we notice about them is that whenever x is above 1, it's positive. Whenever x is between 0 and 1, it's negative, and it doesn't even exist for values okay, of x is less than 0. Now, the x minus 1 squared plus 1 takes the place of x, in effect. It's, it's, the, it's log 10 of that. And you can see that it's always at least 1, okay, because it's 1 plus a square. So if we look at the log 10 curve, really we're only interested in the bit where x is past 1. It's always positive. So we're expecting our curve to always be above the x-axis. So immediately, we lose two of these curves. Now, which of the three left is it? Well, when does it equal 1, the bit in the brackets next to log 10? Well, only when the x minus 1 squared is 0, so x has to be 1. So when x is 1, okay, then we have log to the base 10 of 1. Again, log to the base 10 of 1, as you can see from the curve in the bottom right, is 0. So it will touch 0, but only when x equals 1. Again, there's only one graph that looks like that. Yeah, that's the one. Okay, so we've discovered which of the five graphs fulfills the criteria. So this is the first of the longer questions we're going to look at, question three from 2007. First of all, I'd like you to freeze the video and have a look at parts one, two, and three. Part one is a sketch, part two is an explanation required, and part three is a calculation. So the first thing we're asked to do is to sketch the curve y equals x minus 1 squared plus 1. Now it's clearly a happy quadratic. It's in completed square form. So we can see the vertex must lie at 1, 1. If you sub in 0, you'll find that y is 2 when x is 0. So we've got a happy quadratic vertex at 1, 1, crossing the y-axis at 2, and I've drawn that there on the left-hand side. They also ask us to show i of 1 on the diagram, and of course that's an integral. It's an area beneath the curve, so we just shade in the area beneath the curve between 0 and 1, which I have done. Part 2, they ask you to show that i of c is always positive. Well, the integrand the function we're integrating is x minus c squared plus c squared. That's made up of two squares. Squares are always positive, so the sum of two squares has to be at least zero as well. So the curve is on or above the x-axis, so the integral must be positive. Finally, we're asked to explicitly um, find a formula for i of c. So, we need to integrate this function here. Now there's a couple of ways we can do this. You may have covered the fact that x minus c squared integrates to x minus c cubed over 3, or you might just guess that anyway. Um, if you don't haven't learned that rule, it's the reverse really of the chain rule. If you haven't learned that rule, you can always just multiply out those brackets to give you x squared minus 2xc plus c squared and integrate that. 
Now remember, c squared is simply a constant, so when you integrate c squared, you get c squared x. Now we sub in the values 1 and 0. They're subbing in 1. They're subbing in 0 as x. I've left a bit of the multiplying out. Um, I'm just going straight to the final answer. But it needs a bit more tidying up. But you will find that you will get 2c squared minus c plus 1 third. So we've got part four and part five to come. Let's look at each of those separately. So what's the minimum value of i of c as c varies? And what's the minimum value of i of sine theta as theta varies? So again, if you wish to pause the uh, video, have a go yourself, and then come back to see what I've done. OK. In the first case, i of c is 2 bracket c minus quarter squared plus 5 over 24. Yes, I've completed the square again. OK, as I said, they're very, very keen on the completed square form. And the advantage of the completed square form is it produces a minimum value immediately. That value is 5 over 24. It occurs when c is a quarter, as you can see from the form here. But the minimum value is a happy quadratic is 5 over 24. So the coordinates of the vertex are a quarter, comma, 5 over 24. Now, as to part 5, we've got a sine theta in there. So sine theta goes between minus 1 and 1. So let's just pretend c only varies between minus 1 and 1. So I've drawn a graph below showing c varying between minus 1 and 1. Now, we know the vertex is at a quarter, and I've drawn that in. And then we just do a little sketch of the quadratic. Now, when you're trying to find maximum or minimum values for that point, you either look for actual maximums and minimums, as in stationary points, or you look at endpoints. Yeah, the greatest value of a curve will always be at either one end or the other of a curve, or it will be at one of the stationary points, one of the local maximums. Likewise for minimums. It'll either be at a local minimum, as we have on here, or at one or at the other end of the curve. So you can see quickly from the diagram, there's two possibilities. Um, and the one on the left-hand side is clearly the larger value. OK, so we're having a look here. This value is clearly larger than this value. The reason is it's further away from a quarter. OK, so minus 1 is the highest point, of, produces the highest point on this curve. So we sub minus 1 into the formula. Here we go. And we get 10 over 3 as our answer. So 10 over 3 is the greatest value you can achieve if you're only allowed to put cos theta is in as um, c. So another longer question taken from the 2008 paper. It's got a curve sketch for you there. That's f of x. And it asks you which of the three below corresponds to f of minus x, f of x minus 1, and minus f of x. Now these are three simple transformations that you should be immediately aware of. So f of x minus 1 means you shift to the right by one unit minus f of x, every y value is now minus what it was before, that's a reflection in the x-axis, and f of minus x is the reflection in the y-axis. Now, it's fairly clear from that, I hope you can see, that those are how the three correspond. Now it's asking you to sketch on the axis opposite graphs of both of the following functions. We're going to do them one at a time. They're asking you for stationary points. And and these are when I see this curve, I, I have no idea initially what this curve looks like. So when you when you don't know what a curve looks like, you look at various things. 
Um, they don't want to differentiate or anything that, like that to find stationary points. Um, they, they would indicate that if they did. But try in some extreme values. Think about what, what curves you know that look a little like it. Okay, there's obviously an index going on here. Um, and then fiddle around a bit, maybe plot some points, get an idea of what it might look like. So I'm going to let you have a go, first of all, at the first one, y equals 2 to the minus x squared. Okay, and then later we'll look at 2 to the 2x minus x squared. Okay, so pause the video, have a go yourself, and then we'll have a look at my approach. Okay, so first of all, we're going to look at sketching y equals 2 to the minus x squared. So first of all, a useful thing to spot is that it's what's known as an even function. Now, even functions have the same value whether you put, for instance, 1 in or minus 1. They have the same value if you put in 2 or minus 2, etc. And this is because of the x squared term in the index. Okay, so if, I, if x were 3, I'd have 2 to the minus 9. If x were minus 3, I'd have 2 to the minus 9. Now, even functions like this, where it doesn't matter if you put plus 5 in or minus 5 in, have a lovely symmetry. They're symmetrical in the y-axis. They have the same shape either side of the y-axis. So we've got that to begin with. We also notice that as x becomes huge, and this is a useful tip with graphs, see what happens as x tends towards infinity. Well, 2 to the minus x squared is 1 over 2 to the x squared, which is 1 over 2 to a huge number which is 1 over a even huger number, which is a tiny, tiny, tiny number. Okay, So, as x tends to infinity, y is tending towards 0. Yep. x squared gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So 1 over 2 to the x squared gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So this curve is declining okay, towards the x-axis. It's asymptotic to the x-axis. And of course, because it's even, it'll do that on the other side as well. As we said, it's a reflection. Now, What's going to be the largest power, or rather the largest value, is when you put x is naught in there. Okay, so when you put x is naught, you get 2 to the naught, which is 1. Try another value, for instance x is a half, you'd get 2 to the minus a quarter, which is 1 over 2 to the quarter, okay, which is a bigger, a smaller number rather than 1. Okay, so you can try it out if you wish, but you'll find that 1 gives you the maximum value. So we get a, a sort of bell-shaped curve like this. Now we're going to use this curve to help build our next curve. And it's often the case they've given you a hint at the beginning of the question about how you might do this. So let's have a look at the second curve now. So here's the question again, but this time we're going to look at the curve on the left hand side, y equals 2 to the power of 2x minus x squared. So if you want, pause the video and have a go at that one. Okay, now the key is here, yet again, completing the square. If you see a quadratic in a map paper, first thing you do is complete the square. It may well be useful. So, I've completed the square, and 2x minus x squared becomes minus x minus 1 squared plus 1. You have to become proficient at completing the square. Yeah, That's a slightly fiddly one. Minus x minus 1 squared plus 1. Now, I want to keep it in the same sort of form as the previous one. So what I've done is I've noticed that 2 to the minus x minus 1 squared plus 1 can be written as 2 to the minus x minus 1 squared times 2 to the 1, which is just 2. So I've taken that out on the second line. okay, And now we have a transformation we can apply to the original curve. So we've got a 2 on the outside. That means we've vertically stretched it by 2. And instead of a minus x squared, we've replaced our x with a x minus 1. So it's a minus x minus 1 squared. So we've replaced our x with an x minus 1, which means we shift it to the right. So we're going to take the original curve, we're going to stretch it by a factor of 2, and shift it to the right. So shifting it to the right is obvious, what it will do to the curve. Stretching by 2 just makes it a bit steeper. That's difficult to indicate. Um, but we can also work out what the highest point is. Yeah, it was 1 before, or the y value was 1, so it's now become 2. How do we find the x-intercept? Well, that's simply a matter of rather the y-intercept. 
that's simply a matter of subbing an x equal to 0 into the formula. So 2 to the 2x minus x squared gives you 2 to the 0, which is 1. So now we've got a new curve illustrated there in the bottom left. As I mentioned previously, notice how they've used the earlier part of the question in the later part of the question. And this is often the case in these um, mat questions. So pay attention early on. The bits they, the, the, the easy bits they're giving to you, they're not just doing that for no reason. It's so you can use it later yourself. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so another integral defined on the curve we've just been talking about. Now, state the values of C for which I of C is largest. Briefly explain your reasoning. Now, they don't want any calculation of this maximum value, as they're saying. So, we're going to be using the curve here. So, we want to use the curve that we've just um, fiddled around with. Okay, we had a special case. We had it where um, C was 1, actually. But the general curve, 2 to the minus x minus C squared. How can we make the area beneath it the largest if we're integrating between 0 and 1? Okay, so, have a little sketch yourself. Pause the video, have a sketch yourself, fiddle around a bit, and then we'll come back and see what I've done. Okay, let's look at what the curve would look like. Here it is. There's the general case. If you look at the, the large diagram on the bottom left, it's 2 to the minus x squared. To turn it to 2 to the minus x minus c squared, you just shift it across by c. Okay, so it's, it's got that sort of shape that all our previous curves have had with a centre at c. Now, what they want to know is, if you're going to integrate this between 0 and 1, how would you get the greatest area? Okay, so I've got a couple of indications here on the left-hand side. So, for instance, if you made c equal to 0, you made the peak on the y-axis, you get this green shaded area here. Likewise, you shift your c across to 1, you get this green shaded area here. In both cases, in fact, the area will be half of the area beneath the curve. With a bit of thought, though, you can see the diagram here. The way to get the maximum value is to get as much of the middle as possible. It's higher in the middle. There's more area beneath it in the middle of the curve, so you want as much middleness, if that makes uh, makes sense, as possible. And the perfect way to do that is to have c as a half, and then when you integrate between 0 and 1, the peak is right in the middle of your curve, and you get as much area as you possibly can. Okay, You want as much of the higher part of the curve as you can to gain the largest part of the area. And that's what we have here. We have c equals a half, produces the diagram that I've got the pointer on right now. So this is 2009, question 5. And first of all, if you'd like to read the question, there's a fair bit to get in there. Um, and pause the video while you do it. So we're assuming n is even, and we've got two questions. We'll look at them one at a time. So first of all, have a go at drawing a diagram to show that you can always start and finish in the top left square um, in an n by n grid. Okay, so here's an example of a diagram that helps explain why you can always perform this tour on an even n by n grid. So if you uh, follow this sort of comb shape, okay, you should return to where you started. Now, the point about it is you go from left to right, then right to left, left to right, right to left, left to right, right to left, and then you end up in the same column that you started. So provided there's an even number of rows, you can do this left, then right, left, then right, left, then right, and you'll be able to allow yourself to come underneath and come back to where you started from below. Okay, so that diagram illustrates any general case provided you've got an even number of rows. Strictly, the number of columns just has to be any number, which is at least two, and you can still get this diagram, but even by even definitely works.
And now let's look at part two. Is it still possible if you start somewhere else except that top left? Well, it turns out it is. So, for instance, imagine you start here. Well, you just follow the route along the comb from here back to itself. It's still a tour. There we go. Likewise, you could start here. And you just follow the comb around and get back to where you started. Okay, So yes, you can start using this sort of comb shape any way you want and get back to where you started. Okay, this part, rather than just talking about a tour, it talks about how a robot could perform this tour, but it can only do two things. It can move the row it can move forward to the centre of the next square, or it can rotate clockwise through one right angle. Okay, so have a read yourselves, it's quite long. Have a think about it, you might answer part three. Okay, so I'll freeze that now. Here's the first part of question three. Remember it's an N by N grid and command capital F appears little F times. Well it has to cover every single one of the squares in the grid. There are clearly N squared of them. It only goes into each one once. So little F must be N squared. And here's part two. We need to show that R plus one is a multiple of four. Okay, whereas R is the number of rotations, not whole rotations, quarter rotations it makes in its tour. Okay, well the best way to do this is with a diagram. Now initially, it says it's pointing to the right. Then we make some sort of tour, that's the dotted line. It's the comb shape. And if you're going to get back into that top left corner, you're going to have to be coming in from underneath it. Okay, so the last direction it has has to be upwards. It has to be pointing upwards for the last movement of the whole tour. So if you look at a little table here to the right, it starts off blue direction, but that doesn't require a turn because it's already in that direction. And then it can only rotate clockwise. So you could rotate once, twice, three times, four times, five times, six times, seven times, eight times, nine times, ten times, eleven times, etc. But we need to finish on an upward arrow. So as you can see, the choices are 3, 7, 11, OK? Um, if you add 1 to that, you get the whole square, don't you? OK, and it's kind of going to be a multiple of 4. If you add the 1, you use the blue as the 1 if you wish, you'll notice you're bound to get a multiple of 4 if you want to end on one of these upward ones. OK, part 4. Do those two results both hold if the robot starts somewhere else? Well, it still has to cover all the squares, so F remains the same as the number of squares that are covered, okay, N squared. But R plus 1 may no longer be a multiple of 4. Okay, if we take the case shown below, where we start on the second square from the top on the left, it's pointing to the right here. We follow some sort of tor. And as it's finishing, it's about to go here, it must be pointing right as well. OK, so in order to start at pointing right and finish at pointing right, OK, R itself will be a multiple of 4, not R plus 1. So R plus 1 is no longer a multiple of 4. And finally, show that a tour of an n by n grid is not possible when n is odd. OK, so what we're saying here is that if n is odd, f is n squared is also odd. Yeah, an odd number squared is also odd. But as they're saying here, as any tour begins and ends in the same place, you have to move right as many times as you move left and up as many times as you move down. So they come in pairs, so f must be even. But as we said above, f should be odd. So it's impossible, yeah? F can't be both even and odd. OK, we have here the beginning of question 2 from 2011. So I'd like you to...
pause the video and have a go at part one. Remembering, of course, that we're going to use this fact here, that x cubed equals 2x plus 1 in both cases. So in the first part, we force an x cubed in by writing x to the 4 equals x cubed times x. x cubed is 2x plus 1, and the result comes immediately. Now in the second case, we're going to use the first case. So we're going to write x to the 5 as x to the 4 times x. And of course, x to the 4, remember from the first part, is 2x squared plus x. So we get that here multiply it out. We get an x cubed in the next line. So we know that x cubed is 2x plus 1. Sub them all in and result comes very nicely. What you have to watch out for here is a lot of students will just try and attempt to get an x cubed in each of these two answers. Now it works for the first one, but for the second one if you try and force an x cubed in, okay, you won't get very far. So you have to realise you need to use your answer to the very first part in the second part. Yes, The fact that x to the 4 can be written as 2x squared plus x. And in a test, when you're actually sitting this, you may not notice this at first. You may go down some blind alleys. The key is not to panic, to come back and just try another method. So, you may have noticed that both x to the 4 and x to the 5 um, produce quadratics. Now, the question is now telling us that every power of x, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, can be written as a quadratic. Okay, although some of the coefficients may be 0. Um, and it gives you the two examples we've already done. So if we just remind ourselves, those are the two we've already done, and they map in to these two definitions here. Now notice the notation, you just have to get used to it. Okay. The k is the power, and then it becomes the subscript here. So for x to the power 4, you'd have the coefficients a4, b4, and c4. And for x to the power 5, you'd have a5, b5, and c5. So if you look at the x to the 5, there it is at the top. The constant term is 2, the coefficient of x is 4, and the coefficient of x squared is 1. OK, now they want to show a general result, a to the k plus 1 equals ck, b to, or rather, three general results. OK, so if you could have a go at those, please. Pause the video now. So we define x to the k and x to the k plus 1 because our um, proofs required both k and k plus 1. And we use the same trick here that we used in the previous cases, which is taking an x out to get an x to the k. Okay, If we factorise out the x, we get an x to the k and we can plug in a formula involving x to the k into the formula involving x to the k plus 1. So we try it, see what happens. And we get this line here. Okay, we now multiply it out. Use the fact, remember, that x cubed can be replaced with 2x plus 1. Tidy things up so you've got a constant term, an x term, and an x squared term. And now just compare the coefficients. So if we go ak plus 1 must be ck, because remember this is xk plus 1. So the coefficients are ak plus 1, bk plus 1, and ck plus 1. xk plus 1 is ck here. bk plus 1 is ak plus 2ck here. And ck plus 1 is bk here. So we've shown all three at the same time. So here we have part 3 and part 4. We're going to take these one at a time, so if you uh, freeze the video, have a go at part three yourself, and we'll come back to it.
Okay, so hopefully you're warming to the notation now. So they define dk as being ak plus ck minus bk. And clearly dk plus 1 is the same with the subscripts k plus 1. But we know that ak plus 1 is the same as ck. We know that ck plus 1 is the same as bk. And we know that bk plus 1 is the same as ak plus 2ck. Just sub those in. The results we learnt from the part, last part of the question. You get minus ak minus ck plus bk. And of course you'll notice that's minus dk. And now for the second part. Clearly you see that d1 is by definition a1 plus c1 minus b1. And x to the 1, the first power of x, is of course just x. So there's no constant term, a1 is 0. The coefficient of x is 1, and there's no x squared term. So you get that c1 is 0 as well. So in this case, d1 is 0 plus 0 minus 1, which is minus 1. Now we know that d2 is minus d1. So d2 is minus minus 1 which will give us 1. And d3 is minus d2, which is minus a minus a minus 1, or just minus 1. You get minus 1. So we're always going to get this oscillating 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1. And if you look in terms of powers, minus 1 to an even power, the 2, the 4, the 6, the 8, is positive 1. And minus 1 to the odd power, is negative 1, so of course dk is minus 1 to the power k. So another longer question, this time question 3 from 2012. Um, there's a function which is a cubic. We have a sketch of the graph of this function. It appears to have two turning points. And question one in fact says find a condition on the coefficients a, b, c such that the curve has two distinct turning points if and only if this condition is satisfied. So if you freeze the um, video there and have a go at the first part of the question please. So we're interested in turning points which means we want to differentiate and then make equal to naught. We end up with a quadratic, two distinct stationary points, so we need two real distinct roots. Clearly the discriminants required here, we need the discriminant to be positive. So the coefficients are 3, 2a and b, and we sub them in the discriminant and make it greater than naught. And we get an inequality linked to a and b. Okay, so we're going to assume that the um, conditions carry on for the rest of the question. And so there's the coordinates of A and B, or the x-ordinates rather of A and B, and show that the difference between them is 2 thirds root of A squared minus 3B. So again, pause and have a go yourselves first. Okay, so let's find out what these two roots are. So we've got a quadratic. We're going to solve it to find x2 and x1. It's a very general quadratic with letters in, so what we're going to have to do is, um, rather than factorise it, is use the formula. So we put the formula in, minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Somewhat confusingly, you've got an a and a b in the quadratic itself, but they're a different a and b from the uh, formula. Yeah. So we've got a is 3, b is 2a, and c is b. Anyway, if you put those in, tidy it up a little bit, and you get two possible solutions. Minus a minus the root of a squared minus 3b over 3, and minus a plus the square root of a squared minus 3b over 3. Now they want the difference between them, so you do x2 minus x1, and I hope it's not too much, too difficult to tell. They're all going to be over 3. Um, the a's will cancel, and a root of a squared minus 3b minus a minus root of a squared minus 3b gives you 2 root a squared minus 3b over 3. So that's the difference between the two roots.
Now moving on to part three. So we're going to translate it so that one of the turning points at the origin. And we have to show that the translated graph has the formula below. Again, freeze and have a go yourselves. I suggest you sketch this new graph, okay, and, and see if that helps you um, realize what it is you need to do next. Okay, so here's the curve sketched out with A passing through the origin. Uh, the axes are a little thick there, I guess. And clearly we're going to have another root, alpha, okay, over on the right-hand side there. And we should be able to tell the equation of this cubic is x squared x minus alpha. Now, the x minus alpha is because one of the roots is alpha, so it must have a factor x minus alpha. And a little trick here, if a curve touches an axis, it will have a repeated root. So it's not x, x minus alpha, it's x squared, x minus alpha. Also, clearly it's a cubic, so it's got to have an x cubed in it. Okay, so we've got an idea of what the cubic looks like. It must look like x squared for the touching root and x minus alpha for the other root. Okay, let's use that um, to deduce the formula for this particular curve. So we'll use the equation we've just deduced. So g of x is x squared x minus alpha. And multiply that out and get x cubed minus alpha x squared. Now we're going to differentiate it, get 3x squared minus 2 alpha x. And we're interested again in turning points. So factorize first and make that equal to naught. Now x equals naught is one solution, that's x1 there. So clearly the other factor which gives the other solution must be at b. Okay, so 3x minus 2 alpha is naught, alpha is 3x over 2. So we've got two different solutions. But we know from previously that x2 minus x1 is 2 thirds root of a squared minus 3b. But since x1 is naught, that allows us to deduce that x2 is 2 thirds root of a squared minus 3b. Now we can sub that back in to alpha. So alpha is 3 over 2 times 2 thirds root of a squared minus 3 over b, which is the square root of a squared minus 3 over b. Remember alpha is 3x over 2 from this line? Yep. So 3 over 2 times 2 thirds root of a squared minus 3b, which is root of a squared minus 3b. Now summing it back into our original formula for g of x, we've got x squared brackets x minus alpha, which is x squared brackets x minus root of alpha squared minus 3b, as required. Okay, now notice we were told what it's meant to look like g of x, so although I said you had to spot the touching root and the other root, um, you didn't have to really pick out that the formula was going to look like this. They did tell you the formula looked like this. However, it ties in very nicely with your graph, okay, and it helps you to tease out where you're going to get these values from. So here we have part four. It's a question about the area beneath the curve, so it's suggesting integration. Okay, and it mentions a and b being rational, meaning they've been written as fractions where both the numerator and denominator are integers. Okay, so pause and have a go yourselves. Okay, so we've got the sketch of the curve already. I've shaded in the area that we're talking about. And here's your integration to calculate what that area is. So standard integration, there's nothing tricky there. Multiply it out, increase the power by one, divide by the new power. Sub in alpha and zero. Okay, and we get alpha to the four over 12. Now remember that alpha is root of a squared minus three b. We deduced that earlier. So you've got root of a squared minus three b to the four over 12, which is clearly a squared minus three b squared over 12, which is rational if a and b are rational. Okay, because if a and b are rational, a squared would also be rational. 3b would be rational, so a squared minus 3b would be rational. A rational number squared is still rational, and of course if you divide by an integer it stays rational. Okay, so that's rational provided a and b are rational. So 
So the final part, is it possible for R to be a non-zero rational number when A and B are both irrational? Justify your answer. Now I've put the formula there to the right for R, and we've just got to pick some numbers, A and B, both irrational, but somehow when put into that formula they produce a rational number. So it's just about cleverly picking numbers that do this. OK, have a go at that then. OK, as we see, it is possible. You just really clever with your A and B. If you pick A to be the fourth root of 2 and B to be root 2, then you can manage to get the A squared and the 3B to cancel somewhat. OK, so you've now got root 2 minus 3 root 2, which is minus 2 root 2. That squared does give you a rational number, 8. So you have 8 over 12, which is 2 over 3. So the key is to spotting how you can turn it into a single stone, not a root 3 and a root 2 combined, but an all root 2 or all root 3 or all root 5, something like that. Okay, so we've gone for the root 2 approach to it here. Okay, that's the end of this first introductory lecture to the mat. And hopefully you'll listen in to the second one, which is on next week.